Hi, and welcome. I'm Michelle Merchant Johnson with Love Life Coaching, and I'm here today with the amazing Allison Armstrong, and we are going to be sharing with you some insights and information about Allison's incredible book called The Queen's Code. And Allison invited me. This is kind of unique. Many of you may be familiar with Allison and her work because she has spent literally decades studying men. And Allison's work has had incredible influence in the world and on relationships. And she's someone that I admire and respect so much and have learned so much from personally. So mm -hmm. I want to welcome Allison. And mm -hmm. I want to also thank you for this opportunity to share some of my experience with the Queen's Code, too. So it's a little bit different conversation than some we've had in the past. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it leads. And just just thank you. Um, recording the audio book, uh, which people have been asking for since the book was released on the internet 10 years ago. Um, it's the number one question we get at our customer care. And uh, I wouldn't let anybody else do it um, because I think you know this, Michelle. Um, I technically didn't write it. Um, I had no relationship to what people call channeled works. I'd be like, what the heck is that? And uh, But I literally watched a movie and typed as fast as I could. Um, after spending almost 20 years learning enough to be able to write the book, then it like, wrote itself. And uh, so it's... Um, it's a lot like a child where you can only take a little bit of credit for who they are. And mostly, I, like, I'm in awe of my children. <laughs> I'm in awe of the Queen's Code. Yeah. And I I do believe that it was a divine download. Uh, it's definitely an inspired work. And so, um, you know, the fact that you're sharing that you were able to channel it, I, I believe that it was only because of the deep work that you've done that you were probably chosen and able to channel it, but it's an incredible, incredible experience. So we're going to be talking about the Queen's Code today, and I have some notes that I'm going to refer to a little bit because there's a few things that I want to make sure that I bring out, and we can't trust my memory to <laughs> remember all of those, so forgive me for uh, glancing for a minute or two from time to time at my notes, but one thing that I just want to start with, Allison, was as I was sharing with you before we started this recording, listening to the Queen's Code and revisiting the Queen's Code, which I had read some years before, this time was just an incredibly powerful experience. I'm not saying it wasn't powerful before, but somehow listening to it in an auditory way, it hit me a little differently and certain things stood out for me. And maybe that was in part because of the inflection of your voice or just hearing it instead of reading it. Uh, it was incredibly powerful, incredibly moving, and brought me to tears on a number of occasions. So I'm so grateful for the opportunity, and I'm so grateful for what you've shared because I believe that what really stood out for me, if I had kind of an overarching theme for this experience, was the incredible compassion that was there for both men and women. Mm -hmm. And what is really possible when we have a deeper understanding of each other and how the, how the needs of each other can be fulfilled and how we can really be such a blessing and a gift in each other's lives. And I've, you know, I, I'm in the relationship space myself. And so for many years, I've worked in helping mainly single women meet and attract a great relationship. And I believe it can be one of the greatest sources of happiness in our life, or it can be one of the greatest sources of pain, as you know, some of the characters in your in your book are going through painful experiences in their own lives, um, in their relation in the realm of relationships. But what really stands out for me, kind of this overarching theme, is what is really possible, the joy that is really possible, the fulfillment that is really possible, the possibility of having needs met, even needs met that we might have given up on having met <laughs> yeah. in our relation, yeah. and how beautiful that is. So mm. that, was a, that was an overarching theme, and it's so hopeful 
and it's so full of promise. And even for people that have struggled in relationships, which is most of us, right? <laughs> in one way or another, uh, if not all of us, um, there's so much hope and possibility built into this, into this, um, pro the promise of the book of the, of the Queen's Code. So I want to start with something, Allison, by asking you a question. I just want to get out of the way right up front before we go into <laughs> okay. stuff. Is that all right? <laughs> I love you, Michelle. Go anywhere you want to go. All right. Thank you. So one of the things that I hear from women all the time, and I'm sure you've heard this in your work many, many times as well, which is, why are we making women responsible and giving women all the responsibility in the relationships? Now, I'm not saying the Queen Code does that, but, you know, there's this perception out yes. there with women that we're the ones that are responsible. We have to be the ones that learn how to bring out the best in men instead of the worst. We have to be the ones that learn how not to be frog farmers, turning princes into frogs instead of frogs into princes and all of that. So I would love to just get that out of the way first and foremost, right up front before we go into anything else. Would that be all right? Yes, please. Um, well, okay. I'll try to give you a short answer, but the short answer spans years, <laughs> if not decades. Um, what happens to Kimberly in the first chapter of the Queen's Code happened to me. It happened to me in February 1991, where my friend and colleague was called a frog farmer in front of about 150 people. And um, <laughs> she stuck her tongue out at him <laughs> and, um, when he turned around. She was like, <laughs> and and I it, it happened to me. I had that vision of of a farmhouse and and row after row of human <laughs> frogs with human heads and and that began my trying to figure out how was i bringing out the worst in men and and like kimberly i was thrilled to find out that i could have something to do with it because the alternative was that men are jerks they're just jerks and they're i I thought they were con artists and I wanted to reveal the, the the jerk behind the con artist as quickly as I could. So I was particularly antagonistic towards men, not knowing that I was causing many of my own problems. And when you said, you know, most of us struggling in relationships, if not all, my observation since 1991 is, is that human instincts make this utterly predictable like you could say we're doomed um by the way that our brains are affected by hormones and where our hormones affect our thoughts and vice versa and how different we are and so it, i started with finding out what was i doing and then after um we were, began our workshops in 1995 literally so that I could learn how to write the Queen's Code in a, in a very logical way. I did not know it would end up being this download that I just typed as fast as I could. I very methodically was learning all the ways that women emasculated men and all the ways that women justified it and all the different reasons we had. Because I kept encountering, you know, someone who felt the necessity like I did to emasculate men in order to feel safe. You know, my conclusion is they're bigger and stronger and they'll hurt you. I decided that when I was about 16 years old. But someone else that I knew, her justification for emasculating men was they're stupid. They can only do one thing at a time. They're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was my mom, right? And and then, you know, a dear friend of mine, vice president of a bank um it, her reason was that they abuse power men abuse power we have to keep them under check um for god's sake don't give them any more power right we've got to get a you know <laughs> we've got to keep taking their knees out from underneath them so they don't abuse the power they have and 
And it just, I mean, that men are selfish, that are men are like all these different women with these different perspectives that were why they needed <laughs> to keep a check on men and why we as women had to have this collusion to disempower men. To, so, <laughs> so there wouldn't be burping and farting and sperm everywhere, <laughs> as one woman put it. We've got to do this so there won't be burping and farting and sperm everywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, so I started out that way. And as I was transforming my relationship with men, it became hurtful to me to watch women emasculate them. Mm-hmm. But after I had shifted, it, it was so hard to watch the pain that was being inflicted on men and the suffering that it brought back on women and the fear and frustration that women came from in doing this. Well, it was after about a decade that I had enough perspective on why men do what they do when they do it and why women don't understand why they do it, that it just was glaringly obvious, oh my gosh, men are bringing out the worst in women. And they don't even know it. They, they, don't, they don't know what they have to do with the reaction they're getting. Like, like men get really upset and sometimes crushed um, for being shut down or rejected by a woman. But they didn't know that when they approached a woman generated by strong physical or sexual attraction, that they scared us. Mm -hmm. And when we're scared, (laughs) we got fight, flight, and freeze reactions. And sometimes it's a freeze you out. Sometimes it's get the heck out of here as fast as I can. And oftentimes it's a fight reaction. It's an attack. And to get them just to back off with that energy that's scaring us. And they didn't know they were scaring us because to them, it's, there's, they're so, they feel so at our mercy. They can't imagine that they're scary to us. And um, so that's when I started providing the understanding women work. And um, for anyone, um, you know, understanding women online is all about how men are bringing out the worst in women. And it's illuminating even to women. They didn't even realize what was happening to them. And it's and it's even how women bring out the worst in women, right? So um, it takes two to tango. It takes two to tangle. <laughs> it takes two to tank. <laughs> um, and understanding both sides. And I, I love that you brought up the compassion um, because it, if we can have that, if if we could just start that for 95% of us at least, we're doing the best we can with what we've been given and we've been given opposite instincts and an antagonistic outlook and cultural patterns and practices that reinforce it all and what if it's just a huge misperception misinterpretation misunderstanding miscalculation and strategies that are going to create trash over and over and over again because i call it false cause do you know our strategies are based on an assumption of what's causing what we don't want and what will cause what we do want. And those assumptions are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Both women for men and men for women and and even men for themselves. Men are reading and listening to the queen's code and it's altering their perception of why they do what they do and why women react to them the way that they do. They don't, they don't know they, how often they frighten and frustrate us. They're, they're frightened and frustrated too. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting, Michelle, that you bring it up because as women, we think we're pretty um, arrogant 
like we think men are lousy at relationships and we're the ones that are good at it. And if they would just act right, it would turn out. And if they would just do what we said, yeah. it would turn out because we're <laughs> yeah. the all knowing relationship people. And, and if they would think like we thought. <laughs> exactly. And if they paid more attention to their feelings and if they shared more and if they were more sensitive and if they maintained connections and all these things that come naturally with, you know, as you know, I call diff diffuse awareness, the way an estrogen soaked brain operates normally, then we think, you know, the world would be a better place if everyone did what women did, if the, if governments were run by women, if, I mean, we're just certain of it. And amongst many of the things I've learned since 1991, no, <laughs> we need each other. We we need the qualities of men and women. We need what's natural for men and women. And we need both men and women to do what is unnatural, what is counter instinctual. Mm -hmm. We will never arrive at what we want to arrive at with human instincts. Ever. Yeah. We'll survive. We'll survive and but we'll never be happy. We'll never be fulfilled. They weren't made for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think at the end, toward the end of the Queen's Code, you say, uh, I'll see if I can get it kind of right, that partnership is not necessarily instinctual, right? Being in partnership I, 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 is not our natural, it's not our natural way. I, I, I mean, I have been trying to unwind this for a long time, and I have not found a single human instinct. Right, something we do compelled by tension. That's the indicator that instinct's present. There's not a single one of them that we do that is in the domain of partnership that creates we're on the same team, not a not just a temporary alliance against an enemy, like that we're actually on the same team and we're gonna stay on the same team even when we're struggling with each other. We're we're not gonna assume the other person's the problem, or even that we're the problem. We're going to keep being, okay, how do we work this out? How do, how do we do this? And, and even, Michelle, and it's important to know that how we can come up with a we solution is by starting with how you started um, before we started recording. You said, Allison, if you had it all your way. Right. That's mm -hmm. something that Claudia teaches in the Queen's Code, that if we start with honoring ourselves so that we're giving the best information we can to our partner with the, the granting, you could call it assumption, but that's not quite it. It's more generous than that. The, the granting that they'll do the best they can with it that their intent is not to use it against us and therefore to trust them with what matters to me the most, that's an honorable and honoring thing to do, that we actually honor other people when we tell them our truth. Mm -hmm. And that's the sharing of those truths and, and the validation, right? Okay, that's how it is for you. This is how it is for me. Okay, now how do we work this out? And we have to keep fear at bay, right? You have to just like, okay, okay this one. is scary. Yeah, it takes a lot of courage. Um, we have to question assumptions. We have to verify everything. Did you do that because of this? <laughs> Which, as you know, Michelle, my study of men started that way with men who I listen to on a regular basis and tried to figure out why they did what they did when they surprised me. And then I thought I had an answer and I'd ask them. And in the beginning, I was wrong. I was always wrong because I took a while to figure out. I assumed they did things for my reasons I would. And they were like sometimes disgusted by what I projected onto them. Like, oh, gross. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's not all on us. They're actually trying so hard and they they don't have the same thing at stake as we do. So much of our connecting is because it makes us feel safe. We we feel 
it's our approach to safety is to connect with other women, with men, with someone in our environment that we think will protect us um, or provide for us. Okay, you know, it's the even just, just like <laughs> waiting for the cashier behind the desk to notice us. The tension can, when usually if it's a man, they're focused on the person right in front of them and everyone else is invisible and inaudible. And our anxiety of are we gonna get helped in time that we think they're feeling and should be responding no, they're focused on serving the person in front of them, just like they'll be when we're the person in front of them. And but our sensitivity to are they aware of me? If they're not aware of me, the tiger could eat me before they notice, right? So we're so sensitive to is someone aware of me, aware of me, aware of me, and and so most of our bonding, even our looking for a relationship, wanting one, it's about safety. And that's not where men get their safety from. So they're not compelled like us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so powerful. Well, and I think this, the, the, whole, the whole vision of the Queen's Code book is to help us both understand each other, even though it's written from the female perspective in the sense that the grandmother, Claudia, who is teaching and sharing these, the, this wisdom with these other women um, it's kind of written from the female perspective and we kind of walk through Kimberly's challenges and we walk through Karen's challenges in her marriage and all of these things. In the teaching, it really is a step-by-step -step guide for us to have greater awareness of what's going on within us, our thoughts, our opinions, what we think about men. I love that that it starts early on with her asking them to just observe what they think about men, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this part really, really struck me and, and really like affected me again this time because I thought, oh, this is so true. This is so true. And it's a big, long list they come up with in the book, right? right. Some of the ones yeah. that you shared, lazy, clueless, slob, inconsiderate, self-centered <laughs> babies, on and on and on, right? Yes. Kirks, assholes. <laughs> yeah. And, and if we're, if we're starting from that place, of that's what we believe about men in general. It's going to be hard to get to a place of having a really great relationship with someone. And I just felt a lot of compassion, both for the men that are having this, you know, projected out there onto them, and also for the women from the pain and the experiences that they've suffered that have brought them to that place of believing that that is true. But yeah. it's such a great place to start because it can give us an awareness until we have an awareness that that's kind of the audio that's going on in yeah. our minds. We can't really have a breakthrough. So I love that she started in that place and teaching, even though it's kind of painful, was kind of painful to listen to and just think about all of the pain that's going on there just from that, just starting from that. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so powerful. And then um, the idea, this is, this is another thing that really stood out for me and really hit me this time. The idea that you, the question that Claudia asks is, okay, there are all these things compared to what, right? The question is, to what? And is it compared to women? Well, some women can be this way too. This is what she brings out in the book, but also um, it's really compared to quote unquote, the perfect person. Right. And this was something that hit me so strongly in, in the book this time is how we're not only comparing, you know, and we all have our own version of that perfect person with the perfect yes. qualities and the perfect amount at the perfect time. We all have our own version of that. And we're not only comparing men to the perfect person and what our vision of that is, our idea of that is, but we're also comparing ourselves to and we're all falling short. We're all falling short. And so we're we're not only in play, in a place of judgment about men, but we're in a place of judgment about ourselves and how detrimental that is to relationships. And that really oh, that really hit me so strongly because I thought, oh, this is so, so, so true. And I think women 
in general are so incredibly hard on their on themselves. In one of the programs that I that I did with single women, Allison, I had them do an exercise where they drew a picture of what they envisioned their inner voice would look like. Their inner mm. voice for their inner voice. And Allison, you mm-hmm. would not believe the ferocious looking pictures I got back of wow. just like monsters with big fangs and claws and saying all kinds of mean, terrible things. And we will we will say things to ourselves as women that we would never in a million years say to our girlfriends. We would have no friends left, right? <laughs> we would have no relationships. So just the judgment that's going on in our minds when we're comparing ourselves and when we're comparing men against this quote unquote perfect person and how what a what a place that is to to try to be starting to have a great relationship from. So just kind of bringing these things into awareness is such a powerful place to start. And then we and then in the Queen's Code. Um, we talk, we talk, I feel like I'm in the conversation now. <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like I'm in the class, the Claudia class. We talk about, uh, how men are not just big, hairy, misbehaving women. Cause that's yeah. another thing we compare them to is what a woman would think or how a woman would respond or how a woman would feel in certain situations without recognizing we're not thinking the same our brains are not the same and we talk about the single focus of men which you already mentioned already yes. how they're focusing in on one thing and uh when when claudia talks about um the piece this i'm so guilty of this Allison. this came so far <laughs> to the forefront the piece where we will ask a man a question and then he doesn't respond right away yes so then we start Put now other questions. Well, we say it in another way. It's like our our assumption is he didn't get it or he didn't hear me. He's not responding. So we start asking it in another way or we ask it in a multiple choice kind of way. Yeah. And, she, and she's describing how the man was searching for the right answer right from the beginning. But before we gave him a chance to answer, we're already pummeling him with all these other questions. And I was thinking, oh, I do this all the time with my husband. I'll ask him a question. He doesn't respond as fast as it seems like I would. And then I'm peppering him with other questions. Yeah. Can I just amend one thing that you said? Yeah. Um, You said he's looking for the right answer from the very beginning. Um, there's, There's two ways that can go. Um, one is he, if he commits himself to the question, he's actually looking for his, the best answer. So he's, he's reviewing everything he knows. He's, it's all reflected in his own values and what he sure is important. He's even reflecting upon what he knows that you need or what will make you happy. I mean, all this went into me asking my husband, should I rent the Ford or the Mitsubishi? (laughs) All this went into him thinking, 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 thinking about it. And he said, I think you'll be happiest with the Ford. (laughs) Right. He was giving me his best answer from the car guy, the every like everything. He's even driven these cars. Right. And. And so that's what they'll do. If you give them the chance, they're looking for the best answer. Now, too often, because they're very sensitive, they can tell that there is a right answer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) That there's the answer you're looking for, that if he gives you something other than that, he's going to pay it. So this is what I meant by there's a fork, right? If we really want to know what they think, and we're willing to wait, they will give us the best answer from so many factors. If we're, we've already got it, like, so why did you say that? Right? <laughs> like, if we're already coming with suspicious and accusation or even, you know, does this like make my butt look, it used to be, does this make my butt look big like that? would be a bad answer now that's a good answer (laughs) 
very confusing. We can't even see our own butts in the first place, and yet they're supposed to be a particularly perfect way, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but they, yeah, they can they can tell when there's a right answer and the wrong answer will cost them. So it's it's very interesting. This what Kimberly is learning from Karen about waiting from the for the well and how she, you know Kimberly starts practicing that in her work and even you know with her best friend's sons she just wishes their mother would listen to them they've got things to say but she keeps interrupting and it's just um so many small adjustments you know of how we're different and like women will will answer a question off the top of our head and then rethink and revise and we feel like that's normal and a prerogative where a man's trying to give you the best and not speak until he knows the best. And he'll even say, I don't know enough about that to give you an opinion. And we think, what are you stupid? You don't have to know anything to give an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so. Ah. I'm glad you, I'm glad you made that distinction between the right and the best answer. Cause I do think that is really important. And I think a key that is brought out in the book is, we have to be effective in our listening. If we're wanting to hear those best answers, we have to allow the space, the time for the man. If he's searching for that best answer, if he's going through that, okay, the Ford or the Mitsubishi, I'm weighing that out in my mind question, right? As an example, mm -hmm. we have to, we have to not jump in so fast that's what that's what i i mean it was brought to my attention so so that i do that so often with my husband so often that i'm peppering him with questions before he has a chance to answer and then really listening uh for what's really going on there and if we're asking his advice or his opinion that's something important to consider because a lot of times we'll also ask for their advice or their opinion and then we'll go, well, I'm going to do this. And he's going, well, why do you even ask me for my advice or opinion? You ask me if, if it's the forward or that doesn't mean you can't have your opinion, but he, he, I think he needs to feel that you've respected the fact that he has given something. He's, he's providing something. He's providing an answer to something that you asked him. Yeah, and I mean, the example I gave of the Ford and Mitsubishi uh, is when we lived in LA and I come to Colorado like I did every month, I needed it like <laughs> oxygen to breathe. And I um, I was at the airport, I needed to rent a car. I had a choice between a Ford and a Mitsubishi. I called Greg, he said, I think you'll be happier, happiest with the Ford. And I rented the Mitsubishi because I wanted to try it. And he, <laughs> it wasn't just, why did you ask me? It was, he felt so deeply disrespected. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't hear from him for hours, which is not normal. When I'd arrive in Colorado, he'd want to talk to me right away because he could hear the joy in my voice just as I was driving to her home for an hour and a half. He'd always talk to me all the way there just because I was just elated to be here. And and I didn't hear from him for hours. And when I reached out, it was just, just cold as ice. <laughs> and I didn't mean to disrespect him. I didn't feel any disrespect in my body. But I at that time, I mean, I learned everything the hard way. I didn't know that to ask the question, what should I do, was asking him to be accountable for the result. And that since he gave me an answer, he was taking accountability. And he was taking accountability like he had ever since we started dating for me being happy. I think he'll be happiest with the Ford. And he considered it his job, right? like most men do for someone that belongs to them to do everything you can to give them what they need and make them happy and i had literally disrespected that mm. and i didn't know it 
you know, most of us never know what has a man turn cold on us and we don't go investigating. We just think they're like a jerk or what's his problem. And one of the things that was really tough, Michelle, is it took me a long time to commit to recording the audiobook. And and when I did a year ago, um in in the middle of recording it, I decided to move to be in 90 steps away from my boyfriend. And as I was recording the, the Queen's Code, I could see that I was frog farming him. Mm. That that I had taken this amazing person that I was willing to leave my home for, <laughs> abandon my home to be near. And I was bringing out the worst in him. And, and in my reality, he had changed. Oh, well, now that I've moved here, every he's going to, you know, now take me for granted and everything's going to be different. And I, the old, old conversation was there in my head. And the Queen's Code saved my life. Because as I was recording it, like the movie that I had watched, right, try to recreate that as much as possible. Um, which is its own interesting thing. Um, I could see, wait a second, I, I'm doing this again. And I went to him and I asked him, you know, is there some way that I have hurt you or hurt your feelings or disrespected you that I can apologize for? And he said, yes, th there is. You. I have been hurt and I have felt disrespected and, but I don't remember what they are. I just know that I felt that. And, but I could tell by the result, right? Like yeah. it's in the queen's code. He was keeping his distance. Someone who had been seeking out me and spending time with me and give me attention and receive my attention. Like, <laughs> who's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I was like, I got more time with you and I didn't live here, right? <laughs> and it's like, wait a second, this is a circumstance. This is something else. And the, the miracle, Michelle, because I mean, he's so, and men are like this, they want to be restored. They want to be whole and they, and they're just not used to us offering what they need. And, and when he couldn't think of something specific for me to own and apologize for, I said, could we try something? And he's like, okay. I said, all right, tell, tell me when you're ready. <laughs> this was on the phone from Mexico where I was spending Christmas with my family without him on a trip he was supposed to come on. <laughs> and he said, mm. okay, when you're ready, he said, okay, I'm ready. I said, I'm sorry for any time and every time I have hurt you. And any time and every time I've hurt your feelings. And any time and every time I have disrespected you. And I just kept going. I'm giving you the short version, but I'm sorry for any time and every time I disregarded you, any time and every time I I interrupted you, any time and every time I blew off or or seem to blow off what you needed, what you were saying. I mean, I just, I just did this blanket anytime and every time of anything that I had done aware of, not aware of that hurt him. And he let it all in. I meant every word of it and he let it all in. And the next thing you know, we were laughing again. We were crying. He said, do you still want to be my girlfriend? <laughs> Like, yeah, do you still want to be my boyfriend? <laughs> yeah. And and we made a promise that that from then on out we would tell the other person mm -hmm. that he because he was just eating it, he was just taking it, which is what men and women both do. We try to we try to get over it on our own, we try to not be so sensitive, we try to not care so much, we try to be more independent. It doesn't matter what he she thinks of me. And instead it's more like, are you okay? Did I do something? <laughs> you know, or 
or ouch, right? What you were gruff with me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was gruff with you. And it was adorable. We were sailing a couple weeks ago and he was on the helm and I didn't do something I was supposed to do on the lines. And he said something to me. And then he said, sorry, that was gruff. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I didn't mean to gruff. And then he purposely used my family nickname. And he's like, Allie, could you please do this now? I'm like, you just called me Allie. He said, yeah, I don't think I can be gruff while calling you Allie at the same time. (laughs) And the beautiful thing is this was all in front of his eldest daughter. Right. And who's, you know, his children have been marveling at who Dan is with me and because of me, and they love it. And she got to see him apologize for something that he'd done all his life, right? Be really gruff. And he got to see him stop, catch it, apologize, correct it, like boom, 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 and us talking out loud about it and even laughing about it. And So powerful and so beautiful, Allison. And, you know, I think this is, again, another thing that comes forward in the teaching of the Queen's Code is is being willing and able to speak about those things, sharing our needs, sharing our needs in a way where we're also respectful of the other person's needs and asking for what we want and um, letting a man know what he can provide for us and also not being afraid when we feel like something is off to be able to go there. I think that's another thing that happens so often in relationships. Like you're saying, we both kind of try to deal with it on our own and figure it out on our own. But if we're committed to partnership, we have to we have to be willing to have the courage to bring up those things that are really going on in the relationship. And you ask the question, you ask the questions. Have I hurt you in some way? Have I disrespected you in some way? Is there some way that I've hurt your feelings? And if we ignore that, then what happens is then the resentment builds up. We become deeper entrenched in our beliefs about this other person and how they're wrong and how they're bad. And and one question that I always love so much that comes from the Queen's Code is, you know, is a question that Claudia invites us to think about is what if there's a really great reason about why he's doing what he's doing or a really good reason and if we kind of start from that place of assuming that there's a really good reason why someone is acting a certain way or doing things a certain way or is acting in a way we don't fully understand i mean what is possible just from that question it's so incredible it can change everything and um That question actually came um, when Greg, um, early in our marriage, (laughs) he knocked over an appliance, a, a, a blender in the pantry, and he left it there. Oh. Busted. Oh. And I, yeah, and I was furious with him. Right. And the word in my head was always asshole. (laughs) And I. (laughs) And then I was like, wait a second. (laughs) I know he's not that. Right. Okay, so what what if there is a good reason that he left it there? That popped in my head. What if there's a good reason? And initially, it was kind of like, what if there's a good reason? Like, what if there's a plausible explanation, right? <laughs> and and I started unwinding it and and learned all this stuff about how we really only do what's important enough to get to the top of the list to be done. And the process by which something becomes important enough to be done to a woman versus to a man is really different. <laughs> yes. There's so many more things that are important to us because of the way estrogen affects the brain. And it was great because I got to actually figure it out. Like I landed on this, wait a second, important. We all only do what's important enough to do, right? <laughs> so mm-hmm. this whole opened up this whole field. But in the process of following that, 
I found out not only is there a plausible reason, there's actually, you know, there's a rational reason, there's an understandable reason, but so much of what men do, they there's goodness in their reason. Do you know they really mean to do good? And it's cute because um, I was just thinking that this is something that that Dan says to me, right? You know, because Greg passed away three years ago. And and just this morning, I was visiting with him before getting on with you. And he said, okay, do good. Do good. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Do yeah, good. Yeah, it's something he prayed. Okay, do good. And he really means it, right? He knows my intent to do good and to and that you know by talking to you you and I we're doing good we're doing good in the world and goodness will come of it and it's amazing how much men pay attention to to doing good and wanting to go do good and and it's it's sad because of not understanding their motives or their perspective that adds up to their actions we think they mean to do bad we think they mean to do harm and they're horrified when they do harm. They have such incredible life altering shame when they have done harm. I mean, it's stunning to me. Um, yeah. So if we could start with what if even just what if there's what if there's a good reason for that? And OK, and could I grant provisionally? Maybe they had a good reason for that. There probably was a good reason for that. And if you can get to, you know, you're a good person. I'm sure you had a good reason for that. Would you share it with me? Then, and you wait, then you'll get that best answer, right? They'll actually tell you, well, I was thinking this and remembering this, and I know this about you. <laughs> it's in, They're paying so much closer attention to us than we know. Because <laughs> they don't show it the way we show it. Yeah. Well, and we're kind of approaching things from a curiosity place when we're opening up that conversation rather than from a place of judgment and assumption, which you already mentioned. And I think yeah. assumptions are one of the biggest relationship <laughs> killers ever when we're when we're yeah. making assumptions and making assumptions about someone's motives and or where they're coming from. And I do think that the vast, vast, vast majority of men out there have great intentions. Well, and, and at the end of the book, we, uh, we talk about the, see, I've included myself in the class. We talk about. <laughs> I love you're sitting at the table. I am. I feel like I'm sitting at the table for these classes. Well, and, and I digress a little bit, but that's one of the wonderful things about this book is listening to you, I did feel like I was going through the classes. I did feel like I was right there at the kitchen table with Claudia and the girls and going through these classes together and learning together. And I could see myself in in each one of them and each one of their experiences. And that's what's really profound is that it's really like a it's really like a guide to help us understand and discover what what areas there are that could really make such an incredible difference. And it's done with so much compassion, like I mentioned earlier. And then at the end of the book, when it's talking about the soul of the man, a soul of a man and the soul of a man being a hero, mm -hmm. when we start seeing what's, where's the hero in this man? What, how is this man showing up as a hero? When we start seeing that, yeah. it's so incredible. It's so incredible how we can see the heroic acts, what men might not even consider to be heroic acts, because like in the book, it says to them, that might mean they have to save a life or something like that. But when we start seeing just the simple heroic acts, the things that men do and the things that men provide every day for those people that they care about or for the world at large, it's incredible how life changing it can be. And it can be so obvious when we start looking for it and it can be so invisible when we're in the mindset of they're all jerks and and et cetera et cetera mm -hmm. may i say something about that yes please um first first of all for anybody looking at me obviously i'm moved and um 
the thing I'm moved by, Michelle, is how um, how much you let yourself be affected by the by the audiobook. You know, you you read the written book. It's been out for ten years. You could you could have read it or listened like, oh, I know this, I know this, I know this, and um, and obviously you you didn't. You 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 can't get that much out of something if you don't have, at the very least, the willingness, right, and preferably the the intent. Do you know? And um, and I just had this sense of <laughs> if people keep listening the way that you did um i could stop talking <laughs> like i could i could i could die and i would have done what i was put here for and um and we published it originally in 2012 on the internet um and it was in 70 countries in, within three weeks. And I realized, like, it can't ever be suppressed. The way that we published it, this can't ever be suppressed. <laughs> ever. Um, even the people buying the ebook from the Queen's Code site, that they could print it out for themselves and print and print and print and print. Right? Like, I just... Um, we didn't seek to protect it in the way that um, is is normal in in the world of publishing, and you're supposed to collect every dollar. Dollar. So I just I just loved listening to you and the things that you got in your your pages and pages of notes, and um, and the thing that you said about sitting at the table, I uh, the experience. And it started with Keys of the Kingdom, which I knew wasn't the book, right? It was the prequel. It was what I could write at the time. And when I sat down to write it, the movie began, which was shocking to me. And then preparing to write the Queen's Code, I I didn't couldn't count on the movie was going to start again, right? I had to, so I, you know, did chapter summaries and all these kind of things and then sat down and the movie started and ab abandoned the whole plan and just typed the movie and since we published it in 2012 I've checked in with from time to time and it's as if the people at the table it's as if they just they just exist they exist in this other dimension and I can check in and I go okay so what's happening with you guys and um, one of the last times that I did that, right, like, so, so what's happening with you guys? Because I've always known there was going to be a third book, right? You can tell at the end of the Queen's Code. Yeah, the, the end and the beginning. Exactly. You could, I mean, it's just, and so I always knew nothing, it wouldn't all fit, right? Originally, it was supposed to be published by a New York publishing house, Random House, and they wanted me to cut out half the words. Mm. How, how can you cut out half a story, right? And so I always, even in the 96,000 words, I knew there was going to be more. And so um, a little while ago, I checked in and like, okay, so what's what's happening with you guys? And And as usual, they shocked me because there they were in the garden at the table, right? This very special table, but they were not just women anymore. <laughs> they were not just women and Bert going down on, you know, one knee to answer Claudia's question. There were men, there are men at the table <laughs> mm. wanting to learn and wanting to contribute to the process, you know, as much as, as Bert. It does in the Queen's Code, and um, what a tickle! And I, I just love that you said you're you're sitting there at the table, and and I was sitting at the table. You know, people have asked which character am I? All of them. <laughs> yeah, me too. I I could relate to all of them. Yeah, uh, you know, having spent a long time single and relating to Kimberly and now having been married for well coming on 16 years next month uh, wow. and, 
definitely relate. I can definitely relate to the whole spectrum. And, and I also, you know, I also love that, that I, I also, we haven't talked about this yet, but I just want to give this a quick mention. I also love the, um, the chapter about sex and exploring sex because, well, it's a place that uh, sometimes can be tricky to go for a lot of people. There's a lot of charge for a lot of people around sex, a lot of emotions around it. And, yes. uh, and the part that it plays in a relationship and a healthy relationship and that sort of thing. And that chapter also really struck me as being incredibly compassionate, um, helping us to understand our needs in that area and helping us to understand, you know, how we, we navigate the different phases of a relationship, the early stages of the relationship where there tends to be a lot of sex and it's hormone driven and all of that kind of stuff. And then how, you know, life can kind of get in the way and, and that the importance of that can kind of go to the back burner for a period of time um, and the importance of that in a healthy relationship and, and even taking on the topic of um, really compassionately and really beautifully if someone has had abuse in their past and that sort of thing. I mean, I just feel like this book is so compassionate to both men and women. And I just feel like it's just such a, I know your other books called Keys to the Kingdom, but I feel like this has a lot of keys to the kingdom in it. With it. <laughs> and the Queen's Code allows women to be in a relationship where they can feel like a queen and they can be partnered with a man who feels like a king. And that to me is incredibly beautiful. Thank you. It's an amazing, it's an amazing, it's an amazing journey. And I, I'm just so grateful that you invited me to, to have this conversation so that it did inspire me to really, really listen in a way that opened my heart and my soul uh, far beyond I, what I imagined. Because I, in my mind, I kind of thought, okay, I'm going to kind of revisit this. Yes. I didn't expect it to be as powerful as it was for me. It was incredibly powerful and really incredibly moving and really did bring me to tears on many occasions, both for the sadness and pain that's out there and also for what is possible. And that's what I think is so empowering about it is it's such a message of hope for what is possible in our relationships. You know, because of the way that it came through, right? As this movie I watched and typed as fast as I could. Um, when I was recording the audio book, it had the same effect on me. I mean, I, I'd have to stop and do retakes um, because I was laughing <laughs> too hard. <laughs> like Kimberly's remark of, you know, and I don't even have a horse. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Or, or when, when Jack almost falls out of his chair and, um, or Claudia, do you know, going on 80 years old, going, you know, you might jumpstart me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. and, and like, oh my. And and then and then there were other times I had to stop and we even took a break in the recording studio because I was sobbing, just like heart wrenching sobs. And um it's uh Yeah, it's just its own thing. And it doesn't matter. I mean, I, before I recorded the audiobook, I'd done so many like edits and, and proofreads, which we still can't ever get all the typos out because anybody proofreading it gets caught up in the story. And it, even pros miss so many things. It's so funny. And, and then I did book clubs. And so I would reread the chapter to prepare for the book clubs that I did at the Shift Network. And then and then I'm doing this thing called Your Queen's Code Journey, where I'm going through chapter by chapter with people who 
get to ask me questions once a week on on Zoom. I, I finished one and I'm gonna start another one in November. And and so I re-listened to the chapter before being there to answer their questions. And every time I hear things that I don't remember in the book. It's like rewatching a movie and like, oh, I forgot that part, or I didn't see that part before. How can that keep happening to me? I'm on like my ninth, tenth, twelfth time. And I'm still like I didn't know, I didn't know Claudia taught that. I didn't know we did that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and it's just even, you're talking about chapter five, right? Um, about delicious sexual partnerships. And, and I realized, okay, Dan and I have been together for almost two years and I haven't asked him what his jump starts are. <laughs> mm-hmm, jump starts, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, jump starts are awesome. And, and so I did, right? And it just seems hilarious at this point um, that I would be asking him, so what gets you going? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and, and then, I think, I think you could, I think you could be in a relationship for much, much longer than two years and still not know that. Because again, it's something we don't always talk about, even in an intimate partnership, we're having sex, but we don't talk about sex. Like yes, we're having yes. sex, but we're too afraid to talk about sex. Yes, yes. Which I've been known to say: if you're if you can't talk about it, you shouldn't do it. Right. <laughs> and Dan and I talk a lot. I mean, really, like stunningly, the communication. But I hadn't asked that question, and when I asked him the question, his answer was so simple and made sense of the last two years, like like when it was more frequent and when it wasn't like it was just the missing of one one small element and <laughs> oh my gosh that's too far it i have to laugh at this being human business or i would right. like, um, yeah. <laughs> well that's the where the that grace happen. and the compassion comes in uh, and a sense of humor <laughs> And the ability to laugh at ourselves because yeah. really really this is this journey about relationships it's all about deeper understanding for ourselves and for other people that's you know and there it, there's no there's no end to it i mean Allison, you've been in this work longer than i have but i've been in it for a decade plus and i'm still amazed at how much there there's always another layer there's always more there's always so much to discover and learn, and that's part of what makes it, it makes it exciting. But it's also part of why we have to have compassion for ourselves and a sense of humor. <laughs> like you said, we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can. This morning, I was um, I had to apologize to Dan again, and um, and my intentions were good. Right. I just we we bake our own bread. Right. And he hadn't been baking his own bread. And so he was living without it. And and I found out yesterday, I'm like, OK, so how about I bake us both bread? And he's like, oh, that'd be awesome. And so this morning, right, I wake up at five o'clock <laughs> and I'm and I'm baking bread and I'm making him this thing we call baffles which are half bread half waffle and I just and I know he doesn't have any and he needs to eat some before he drinks his coffee and I just so want to you know deliver it to him so I'll have it beforehand but I got to go out on my tractor and move the hay because we got to get covered with because there's rain coming and so I have like, like all these things I'm thinking about and doing and so I get some of the bread ready and I'm just gonna you know I go in through his back door and I was just going to set it in the kitchen, you know, without disturbing him because it's early in the morning. He gets up later and he spills all, all this ice all over the kitchen floor. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't know he was awake. I didn't know he was there. He's completely befuddled. And and here I am like, um, but, and then I was just trying to do good, right? And instead, I never show up at his house that time of day. I know not to, right? Right. <laughs> Social after 10. He's social from 10 to 7. Other than that, I just leave the cave alone. And oh my gosh, it was, I was, and then I like 
moving 750 pounds of hay at this at one time at each time and I'm like just self-recrimination like oh, I can't believe I did that I completely threw it off his game I did no 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 and I'm like Allison you're only human how about you forgive yourself and then you know you can apologize to him and I I did I sent him this text you know I'm so sorry I disturbed you I did I didn't mean to I just meant to contribute and could we connect later <laughs> properly and God bless him. The text I get back is, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. You're the best. <laughs> like, <sighs> well, so, that's- yeah. And if you listened all the way to the end of the acknowledgments, you would have heard me mention Dan last, you know, who every day gives me a chance <laughs> to practice the Queen's Code. <laughs> Yeah, and that's another thing that I've found at least to be true with the men that I've had experience with is most men are also very quick to forgive. Oh, my gosh. Most of them don't hold a grudge. Most of them don't keep the score, keep the points. Uh, You know, my my husband, he's so good that way. I'll apologize to him for something. And he's like, oh, it's already gone. It's already forgotten. And he means it. He means it. He's, He's let it go. Yeah. And so that's a that's something I've observed in the men I've had the uh, the experience of dealing with in that way that they're really really quick to to let go of something. And I think we women in general could use a big <laughs> self compassion. <laughs> well, we we do that thing that comes you know with our ovaries of thinking that a man did it for the reasons we would have and the reasons are intolerable you know that he doesn't love me enough to have done what i would have done or he doesn't care enough about me or he doesn't respect me enough right we get really angry and they they don't project that onto us they're hurt but they don't project the why onto us they're just more willing to be mystified and and kind of embalmed, right? And if we just own it, right? Instead of excusing it, like, well, if you had only done such and such, then I wouldn't have had to do that, right? That's <laughs> mm-hmm. that's not going to get what you're talking about. But when we just own it, they. They really don't even want to spend energy hanging on to stuff. It's a waste of energy to them. Right. And it, it's another beautiful thing about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not very energy efficient. Mm-hmm. And they're built to be energy efficient. Mm-hmm. They're definitely built that way, which is why to them there's no point in stating the obvious. <laughs> which is why we have to be patient and listen if we want to really understand them because to them they're obvious they think they're so simple michelle there's so many times that i <laughs> sat on airplanes <laughs> and men have been, you know have asked me you know something about so what do you do and you know I'll say well i've been studying men since 1991 and i've had more than one man say to me are you slow because <laughs> we're, cause we're simple yeah because like, we're not so simple <laughs> yeah they say because we're simple and i and then i like really really you're simple you you're you're walk your walking resolution of paradoxes <laughs> every man you meet you're deciding um you're really concluding whether you you should kill him or die for him That's not simple. And there are nine things a woman has to pay attention to, to have you understand what she needs in a way that's actionable for you. And if she misses any one of those steps, you know, it's thankfully it's taught in the Queen's Code, it won't work. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're way more simple than that. So I actually took out the whole sheet of that and went through it with a, a room of men. And then they validated, oh, yeah, if you don't do that, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, right? Like, and they're not simple. They're they're direct, which they mistake for simplicity. 
and I love their directness. And if we could stop trying to read more into their direct answer, we would benefit by their directness. Mm -hmm. We make it much more complicated. Well, we do, because if, if a man does something we don't understand and we interpret it that he doesn't care or he doesn't respect us or that he doesn't love us, then we have to come up with the reason. Talks about this in the Queen's Code. We have to come up with the okay. reason in our mind as to why he did all this. And then we think we're not enough of this or we're too much of that. We think there's something we have to change about <laughs> ourselves. It's a whole, it's a whole pattern. And we learn <laughs> and discover things about ourselves and about men and really how we both can get more of our wants and needs fulfilled in a loving way in the queen's coat. It's amazing. It's a gift. Michelle, thank you for teaching it so well. I'm really just so moved by how you recreated Um yeah, I'm so moved by it. Thank you. And Thank it was it's you. been my privilege and my honor, really. And I, I love connecting with you, Allison, and I'm I just admire and respect the work you do in the world so much. So any opportunity to connect with you is a privilege and to share more about this and amazing and beautiful work that you have is a blessing and a blessing to the world. So before we wrap, I just want you to share with our listeners how they can find out like more about the next Queen Code journey, the Queen's Code journey, and more about you, because I don't want to leave people hanging with that, wondering that question in their mind. Yeah, well, one, so everything's at alisonarmstrong.com including everything that I have recorded since 2003, which none of that is at Audible, including the Queen's Code audiobook. You can't get there. Um, so come to our site. You'll see, you'll find the book. You'll find our online courses. You'll find my newest live webinar I'm doing, which uh, no accident, Michelle, it's called finding humor and being human. <laughs> we need that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's something about the, the audio book being complete and now live in the world and people can listen to it on the Alison Armstrong mobile app. Um, there's now space. I get to do something I've been working on for over a decade. And that's what is before being male and female. And it being human is before being male and female. And so that's why I, for the next year, I'm getting to distinguish these things that I haven't gotten to before I get to teach them, um, which is very exciting to me. And um, yeah, so that that's the place. That's the place to find everything. Yeah, and I know on your website, you also have some free resources. So people that are just starting and then you can get on Allison's email list and so you can be notified when she's doing new workshops and has new offerings and um, I know Allison's work has been incredibly powerful and helpful for me and I've been able to share her work in other events that I've done and and now with this journey with the Queen's Code and really it's an honor and a privilege and I thank you Allison too for for the opportunity and the privilege and um, really I loved being at the table with the ladies uh, in the Queen's Code <laughs> on this journey. It was it was amazing. Awesome. Well, I'll look for your face in the next movie when it's okay. Starting. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you everyone, for watching. And Allison, thanks again for your generosity and time. My privilege. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.